For today's lesson, you will be needing your Component 1 Ethnicity in Youth Culture handout. This is the title that we're going to be looking at um, today. Uh, we've done this a little bit out of order to the traditional way that we'll be going through these, um, these handbooks, mainly because most of you, apart from the Friday morning class who are a little bit further behind, um, will have done your 35 mark essay uh, on, um, on deviance. And traditionally we would do this as a class essay. What's going to start happening now you're doing this online is you're going to have the chance and the time to do far more 50 mark, 35 mark essays than you would be doing normally. Um, because obviously the lessons, you can go at your own pace, um, and rather than being two and a half hours of me speaking and lots of activities, it's quicker, more individual things, and obviously short little videos. So this is why ethnicity is a little bit out of order. Um, the first thing I would be asking you to do normally was, was look at the board. Um, how's your culture been altered by different ethnicities, and what does cultural uh, diversity bring into a society? You can stop now and have a think about those things if you would like, um, and then pay particular attention to the question at the bottom, which word referred to influence of ethnic minorities in a society. So just to get you thinking and to get your noodles starting to, to focus in on this question of ethnicity, that should be the first thing that you, that you think about now. So take a quick pause on that. Coming back to this, which hopefully you have done now, I'm hoping you've gone with the most obvious example. This is, you know, when we have cultures, we live in a very ethnically diverse society, we see that this ethnic diversity, which we experience now on a vast scale compared to, let's say, in 1920s Britain, um, different ethnicities bring different elements of their culture. And remember, culture, three word definition, according to Ralph Linton, your way of life, including your beliefs, your norms, your values, your dress. Um, your music, and then probably the biggest impact has been food in Britain. So if you think about Britain's national cuisine in the 1960s, the 1970s, it would have been fish and chips on Friday. Now the situation is chicken tikka masala is the, um, is, the, is the most common national dish. That is an example of hybridity, which is the word that we mean when we kind of see two cultures kind of fusing together and, and developing new styles and, and new elements of that culture. The top of your ethnicity booklet, you'll see everybody's favourite um, functionist, Emile Durkheim. And um, when we look at Durkheim, what we remember about his view of youth culture. Jot down some notes here on, on, on what you remember about functionalism and youth culture. This is not going to be something that's specific to today's lesson. However, um, obviously, as per usual, if you remember functionalism, doing a bit of a recap of it every now and again is not going to is not, certainly not going to hurt you. So if you pause at this particular point, what do you remember about the functionist perspective? And maybe if you look at the, um, the top part of the top two sections in your handout, um, what mistakes maybe do our functionalists make, especially when they look at youth culture and potentially what they say about everything? Uh, and then also um, this word ethnocentric. What does that mean? So pause it here. What do you remember about functionalism? What do you remember about dirt farms view of youth culture? And when we come back, we'll fill out that section together. Go. Right, so um, I'm hoping you fill that out now. For, for functionalism, obviously the, the key things that we need to we need to remember for functionalism it is a consensus theory. We'll talk more about that in just a second. It is also a structural theory. When we have a structural theory, here's my little man, and my little man is shaped by the society around him. It must mean that when that is the case, he is a passive, <laughs> slug-like recipient of uh, socialisation. And um, we see everything from a functionist perspective through a rose-tinted view. A macro structural theory, um, and a, a big thing for functionists is this idea of living in a society based on consensus. Now, consensus equals agreement, and the things that we agree on are the norms and the values. Now whenever you think about this, always try and think in your head of what kind of values we are talking about there. Now for some of you might say we all agree on the value of manners, certainly that's a, um, it's not a British value, like respect is a British value, or democracy or the rule of law, but, um, and those are also values, but you might say at the basis, manners, or you might say family. 
Or you might say the sanctity of life. You know, you, you, if you see someone having a heart attack in the street, you don't just walk by and buy your sausage roll from Greg's, do you? You go and you try and help. Uh, in addition to that, though, remember, other things tend to be valued in our society, which are, according to a functionist, very useful to value. We tend to see that skill is something that's very heavily valued in our society. Consequently, when if we, you know, if we have a value system, and we'll learn this next year, we, when we have a system of values, it inevitably leads to this shape, which is a hierarchy. And hierarchies are built in a triangular shape because you have very few at the top and you have very many at the bottom. And when you create a value system, values create hierarchies. So even if you say you've got a value in popularity, which is something we place a value on, when you think back at your high school, there was one person who was the most popular and there were very few, uh, very many at the bottom who were just the run of the mill average person. It seems like we have a value system on almost everything in society and that creates hierarchies. So if you say skill is something that we tend to value, those who are the best footballers are at the top, they get paid the most, Messi and Ronaldo, and then there's all your Sunday league, um, you know, people walking around being sick because they've been on the night out the night before. So um, values inevitably create hierarchies and we live in a society where we agree upon all of these values. When you get to the top of a hierarchy, you tend to have money and power and status and all the things that come with that which we all appear to value as well you value education which is exactly the reason why you're doing this but some of you when it comes into your qualifications will get better ones than the majority because not very many people get a stars and everything do they um and then even between that there'll be people who get one mark higher on average or two marks higher so we have a you know when it comes to things we all have this value consensus, and this is the functionist idea. That's very, very good. Now, Durkheim, when it comes to youth culture, Emil Durkheim, who is the, uh, the founder of functionism, would say that we are in one big homogenous youth culture. Okay? So they look at youth culture as a whole. Remember, there's no subcultures that they're going to discuss, um, there's no, certainly no neo tribes that they discuss. They're concerned about youth culture as one big homogenous group because remember the whole of society is in consensus on the norms and the values. So the first point here is a big mistake that they might make is they might think that we're all homogenous. They all might think that we are the same where people are quite different in our society, lots of different cultures. That's a difference. In our society, lots of different hobbies, I don't know, lots of different genders, different genders, do you know what I mean? So we, we can't be the same, lots of different ethnicities, so we can't potentially all be absolutely homogenous, we can't all have one cultural identity, we're going to vary. And that is also going to mean that we, and this is the second big problem with functionalism, is Durkheim thinks that we all share the same experiences. And really, I think it's quite obvious to say that we probably don't share the same experiences. You certainly don't have the same experience growing up if you are a um, black working class woman compared to you if you are a white middle class male. Your experience of society and your experience of your, your, your time in, in, in youth will be very different. Now, moving back on to us, this idea of youth culture, remember, youth culture does serve a purpose because remember, it's functionalism, so everything in society, even the nasty things have got purpose, and the purpose of youth culture for Durkheim is a transition. Now, this transition will prevent falling into the horrible state of anime, which is normlessness. And we all know that being normless will lead to depression, isolation, suicide. And, and just to be clear, so you've got a picture of really what he means by that, in his famous study Suicide, he looks at like women who um, fall into a state of anime when potentially their husbands have died or they've been divorced. So, uh, you know, normlessness doesn't it doesn't mean you're just like a feral kid running around, you don't know how to speak and you, you don't know how to act, you can't eat with a knife and fork. Because it's very rare that people who are well socialised when they're young can do that. What he means is the norms and the, the values that you have one day are kind of eroded the next day. So imagine if all of a sudden your, your, your wife gets up and leaves you. You used to go out for tea with her, you used to maybe have your clothes cleaned, you used to... Um, the food who was sleeping in bed next to somebody, you, you used to have somebody to talk to. All those norms, all those values suddenly start to disappear and that's very isolating. So when you're in that isolated state, it's depression, it's loneliness, 
is potentially suicide. Or, from the other perspective that we'll look at next year, this state of anime will lead you to criminality. Um, so, Durkheim's big problem is, if we are all homogenous, and we all share the same norms and values, and experiences, how do we account for differences in ethnicity? And unfortunately, we can make the case against Durkheim is that um, in, in him having these beliefs, everybody's culturally the same and everybody shares similar experiences, he tends to be described as an ethnocentric thinker. An ethnocentric in the fact that, look at Emile Durkheim, he is a white male. And he's theorising from a white male's perspective and generalising to everybody else. So when you looked at your functionalists from the start of the year, when we did look at youth culture, you'll notice the likes of Parsons, Abrams, Eisenstadt, they are all old white men. And therefore, they could be described as ethnocentric. They are biased towards the, the, the ethnic group that they belong to, which is white. Now, we know that people from different ethnic backgrounds will have different sets of beliefs. We'll have different dress sense, we'll have different musical tastes and musical culture that we associate with them. So that's a big problem with what Durkheim says. So for today's kind of lesson, we are going to look at how ethnicity affects your membership of youth culture. And hopefully in your head, you might already have a couple of key writers here that you know, well, actually we have done at least one key writer who's very specifically says something about um, youth when it, when it looks at black people. And that will be something that will hopefully come up today. So remember, all this stuff that we've done, because sociology is so multi-purpose, you can apply your knowledge elsewhere to this question. So it's quite a simple, straightforward topic now. And because we, we've really made sure that you know all of your social theories, and we've been super, super strong on making sure that you've got that in the tank, um, in addition to um, you know, focusing quite heavily on the deviance topics, you know the social theory so well that now when we come to these little topics at the end of the course, class, ethnicity, for next week, school, you've already got key writers that you could potentially draw upon. Now, a little bit of history for you here. So if you take a look at page one, halfway down, what you'll see um, is that we, we tend to get a lot of immigration into this country, a lot of migrants um, from the Caribbean in the 1940s and the 1950s. So just to contextualise it for you, that's what's going on. You might have heard of Windrush. Um, which was the, the, the ship that, first ship that came over bringing um, Caribbean migrants over to this particular country. So what they do is they move over in the hope of, like most migrants do, having a better life, getting a job, earning more than they would do where they've come from and having a better quality and standard of, of, of living. Now, as you'll see from the picture here, keep Britain white um, with this woman. This was you know, the example of the kind of things that will be daubed on doors, you have broken windows. You might have seen um, in the hotel room windows that have signs that would say like, no black, no Irish, no dogs. Um, so when they move over, they are faced with a whole wave of racism from, from, from British culture. You could link this in, you know, with the skinheads who a few years later really targeted black people as well as um, Asian migrants as well. So any kind of migrant to, to this country, and, and to most countries, most you know, white countries, as, as uh, you know, predominantly white countries, have faced a backlash of, of racism. I think it's normal, it's not right, but it's normal. It tends to seem to be a pattern that happens in most societies. Um, so this is what is going on in the 40s and the 50s. Now, if you turn your page over, we are gonna look um, at a particular um, explanation for why we see black youth subcultures forming. Um, and before you, you start to read this, there's one, two, three uh, examples of film that I think it's really worth you watching. Um, if you want to start here, these basically are old movies that will um, that kind of document. This one's like an immigrant's journey, and over here are some news clippings from the time which show, um, or some media clips from the time which show basically the negative treatment of black people um, in London in the Notting Hill area, which led to some race riots um, in the late 1950s. And you know, they're, not, they're not very pleasant to watch, but you really, you really will start to get a sense of what the migrant black community are having to go through in, in England, in Britain, at that particular time. And it leads to 
It leads. I hope you didn't see Joe popping there in the back of the shop. Don't want his ugly face on it. Uh, it will lead to um, some explanations as to why we see black geek subcultures forming. Now, here's this word popping up again, resistance. And I'm hoping, as soon as you see that word resistance, alarm bells start going off and you go, well, hold on, I've, we did Marxism and resistance, we've done feminism and resistance, and now we're gonna look at ethnicity and resistance. Well, they all are based around these ideas of resistance. Obviously, for a Marxist, it's resistance to capitalism. For a feminist, it's resistance to the patriarchy. And when we see um, sociological research done into ethnic minorities and the treatment of black people, it is resistance, but it is going to be resistance to forms of racism. Now, what we can see here is Hedvig very famously says that um, youth cultures develop as a resistance to dominant ideology. So the dominant culture in Britain at the time when we see black migration is a white culture and we see black people then marginalised, pushed to one side, treated badly on the basis of their race. And this is supported by, and know how I'm kind of weaving these key writers together here because you could put these in the same paragraph, Sivanadan, who says that actually black subcultures form in England, and remember these aren't formed pre-journey, pre-migration journey, they form in England um, as a response to colonial oppression. Now that might mean very, very little to you uh, at the minute, but when we're talking about colonial oppression, we mean the fact that Britain's got a massive empire. And over time that empire expands to, you know, to parts of North America and Africa and India and all over the globe. So what we see there is white people coming to areas where there are different ethnicities and taking over essentially and trying to force maybe white British values and a white British way of life onto these people. And then when we see black people coming over and facing racism, they're going to join youth subcultures on the basis of, of, of this colonial kind of struggle. So if you've got if you want to pause it now, have a look at those three videos quickly, and we'll come back in a sec. Right, so, now you've watched the three, you'll see in particular that I'm focusing here on one particular um, ethnic subculture, which is um, Rastas, you can tell by the colour. Um, so, Rastafarian is a, is a good example of a response to racism felt by ethnic minorities coming over to this country. Incidentally, as I said to you earlier, given the context, it's, it's not till the 1940s and 50s that we start to see migrants from the Caribbean um, coming to this country and uh, looking for work. We don't actually see the Rastas emerge in a strong way until the 1970s. So what you need to think about is, well, who is who's involved in that subculture there? If you're getting people coming in the 1940s and the 50s, we don't see this culture emerging to resist until the 70s. But there was still racism in the 40s and 50s. Why is that? Well, if you think about it, the initial people who will have been victims of racism will be coming over looking for work. Generally, we don't tend to see young people or that the people we associate with subcultural, like youth subculture ages, coming over for work. They might have been 25 plus or something, the, the initial migrants. It's the sons and the daughters of these initial migrants who are starting to then form the Rastas. They've seen their parents victims of racism and now, in order to resist against this, this dominant, this white oppression, this white ideology, that is why they see the Rastas forming. So it's actually the children um, of the first kind of generation um, migrants who are going to be the ones who, uh, who form these particular groups. Here is an example when we think of colonialism, and if you look through these slides, they're quite unpleasant. When we mean what we, when I say colonialism, this is the kind of thing that we would mean. So, images from Africa when we were, um, you know, making our way through their occupying countries um, and, and using, you know, people there in India and in Africa, kind of almost, you know, as, as slaves almost for. for for lack of a better term, you know, here's, here's the, of all the white people, they've got one Indian person now and he's sitting on the floor. Now, um, 
just as a weird little fact, they, um, Crystal Palace, the football team, was named after a, a big Crystal Palace, no doubt, that was built there during Queen Victoria's time to house an exhibition. Uh, and that exhibition had exhibits from all over the empire. And rather than you thinking of and this museum exhibition will be of artefacts, it, it was actually of live people. So what they would do is they would actually bring over people from Africa and have them stand in this Crystal Palace kind of museum as live exhibits. Again, in a very dehumanising way for people of um, occupied colonial countries. So you can see potentially why we've got this um, angst and, and desire to be um, confrontational and resistant to the white oppressors that are you know, colonially have dominated for quite a long time. Um, we move on, onto the bottom of page number two. Uh, what we start to see is almost in like incorporation style, the, um, the commercialization of kind of Rastafarianism and black street style. Um, and we can see this through um, the use of dreadlocks. You know, you, you can see white people now with dreadlocks. They're not wearing it potentially for any cultural reason, they're wearing it because they think it looks cool. You see UB40 in the specials, you know, bands that have got reggae beats um, in terms of their origin, but they've got white members. Um, this, I mean, which perspective would be most likely to say that, well, we, what we see here is almost incorporation of style into the mainstream, and you don't need to be black to have dreadlocks because dreadlocks are just there worn for style. And of course, the answer is at the bottom, postmodernism. We can see this kind of today um, in terms of, you know, Newton Faulkner, for example, guitarist, he's got dreadlocks and stuff. He's, you know, he's a white ginger dude. So, um, so again, it, it's the taking of style, the taking of different cultural dresses and the wearing them, of them for no real reason other than you think they look cool. And that shows the impact of globalization, the world getting smaller in your choices of style, polymers. Supermarket of style all over again. Uh, if you turn yourselves on to page number three, uh, what you will see is some hip hop culture. Now, hip hop being a mixture of um, hip hop, uh, rap, uh, drum and bass, and um, obviously you should be aware of hip hop through artists like Tupac, Biggie, um, NWA. There is a quiz there for you to fill out. So give that a whirl, give it a guess. I'm not going to give you the answers, you can look those ones up yourselves. Um, and what we've got here is just a quick line that would say that many of the artists write hip-hop music to promote a ghetto lifestyle, um, which deviates from the hegemonic, normal, kind of polite, submissive way of living. Notice that word hegemonic in, as well there. Um, again, I think maybe that would be possibly something that you would talk about in a 35 mark essay, 15 marker, it's just a little bit, it's, it's not quite enough information to get a, a big chunky paragraph out of that. Uh, so, have a go at doing the quiz, look up your answers, and then in a second we'll come back and look at page number three. Page number four, um, we move on to, um, we've looked at black subcultures through the raster, we are now going to look at Asian youth subcultures. There are uh, two um, little videos to watch here, I would start with the one in the bottom left hand corner, it's a clip from Rick and Morty, and then once you watch that, Bottom right hand corner, you will have a bit of a musical awakening. So watch those two clips now, and we'll come back in a sec. So the culture that we are going to be looking at from, uh, from an Asian perspective is investigated by Johar, and that culture is known as Brasian. It is a hybrid culture. Now remember, we talked about that key concept of hybridity a little bit early, the kind of overlapping of of two cultures. You know, chicken tikka masala is the nation's dish. Chicken tikka masala is not a traditional kind of curry, it's one that's made with loads of like ketchup and tomato and stuff. So it's made here, but it's based on um, traditional ethnic cuisine. So it's a hybrid culture. And, and what we see is uh, Brazen here being an example. So it's, it's an example, curry is an example of hybridity. And what do we, what we see, see, see here is Brazen as an example of a hybrid culture. It's when two cultures are fusing together. And what Johar says is that our British Asians have combined the new kind of British culture that they have and have adopted with their traditional Asian culture and fused them together. And the reason for this 
and this is why I've shown you the Rick and Morty clip, is they did not want to fully assimilate. So in the Rick and Morty clip, you've got unity, um, and unity assimilates every person on the planet by vomiting into each other's mouths. And then she becomes one of them. So all of the people are the same. They have the same behaviours, they like the same things, they are completely and utterly identical, and that's what assimilation means. With our Asian youth cultures, according to Joha, they did not want to fully assimilate. Okay, They had faced some racism, they had felt faced some rejection, so they didn't want to totally give up on their, um, their ethnic background, they wanted to kind of fuse two things together. So they didn't want to be, they didn't want to have full assimilation. So what it allows them to do is express their kind of culture from their homeland, uh, from their parents, from their grandparents, and mix it with the British culture which they're currently living in. Some examples would be um, like Apache Indian single, like J Ho by the, um, uh, the Pussycat Dolls, Broom Full of Asher by Corner Shop is a video that you've just watched, um, and you can see the popularity, according to Bennett, of, of Bangra, this, this Indian folk music and British pop allows Asians to feel part of Britain, but also um, part of Asia at the same time. Obviously, it is attractive to consumers in our pick and mix economy. So now you can be a white person who enjoys this kind of this type of music as well, because you know, if you like it, you may as well just do it, haven't you? And that's postmodernism. We move on to our, our kind of final two other explanations here of ethnicity and youth culture and this is resistance against racism now you'll notice that fellow at the bottom there is milky from uh this is england which we watched earlier this year and uh, this is this is england's quite weird because you would see milky hanging about with the like sean and some of the the nice skinheads from this is england and um and, and woody but you think well why is milky skinhead he's not a skinhead you will notice that milky wears the hat and that hat kind of denotes that he's different from the skinheads. Even though he's wearing the same braces, same type of Ben Sherman top, what Milky is, he's actually a rude boy. And rude boy is kind of like a Jamaican um, like gang kind of style that we, that, that we see coming over now. Rudies, as he would have been called, um, were potentially a, a lawless youth. They like ska, they like reggae music. Um, and again, we've got this idea of, of, of transferring this ident identity over into the UK, um, defying the racism that they felt um, and that they may have received in, um, in, the, in, in the United Kingdom. Um, now, we can link this formation of the, the rude boy identity in the UK to a very, very popular case study uh, and a moral panic which is Stuart Hall's policing the crisis. Using the word bank there, pause the video, and can you answer the questions that are on the bottom of page number four, please? Okay, so Stuart Hall pointed out that young black men were closely linked to muggings. That was a crime that was going on. Youth subcultures have allowed people to resist and react against racism, e.g. the Rudy movement became popular in the UK in the 1970s when there was much racial conflict. Black people were scapegoats for um, crime on the street, this crime, okay? Um, it was distracting people from the problems that were created by capitalism, okay? So black people were to blame, according to Stuart Hall. They are the scapegoats. The media create this kind of moral panic. And remember, when we look traditionally at anything that's a moral panic, the theory that we're talking about is interactionism. So normally, interactionism starts with an act. And here, that would be a mugging. You go on to have the press create a moral panic. And in a moral panic, you need the group to fear. That would be our folk devils. Our folk devils would be here, maybe the rude boys. Black people. And we end up with stage four deviancy amplification, where the deviance or the crime is going to be made worse. And we can see that through a greater number of arrests of black people and also 
through the stop and search statistics, which are now up to nine times more likely to be stopped and searched if you're black. That would be our traditional interactions perspective. But what actually Hall says is that he gives a reason for this moral panic existing. And the reason that this moral panic exists is not because it's genuine, but it is to distract. So the faux devils are actually the scapegoats here. And it needs to distract from capitalism. And the problem of unemployment, and low wages, and urban decay, everything that Mike Brake said, which capitalism has caused. Because of that, as well as writing from an interactionist perspective, Paul is also writing from a Marxist perspective. He's kind of fusing two things together because we can see that actually there's an explanation for what happens first and the big problem with that is obviously going to be capitalism. This might explain, and Stuart Hall's theory of policing the crisis, might explain why we see Rudy's, you know, the rude boy kind of um, culture forming in the UK because they're facing this kind of you know, um, unpleasant interactions with the police and with the general public, which has been caused by the media's moral panic against them. Final page, uh, which is number five, and we are almost done. Now, on page number five, what you've got is ethnic subcultures in school, and a fellow called Toby Sewell. Now, what Sewell does, a famous study, uh, trying to explain black boys underachievement. Previously, black boys, just like Bangladeshi boys, were really at the bottom of the overall GCSE grades. Not the case anymore, because it's white working class lads who are now at the bottom. So there's a, I suppose, if you want to class it as a problem, there's a new problem that, that needs to be dealt with by the government. Uh, and it's the fact that um, now it's the white working class boys who do far worse than, than any other ethnicity. But Sewell's writing in 1997 when black boys are the ones who are underachieving the most. Uh, and what he says is actually they need to adopt a macho, gangster, rebellious kind of behaviour as a response to the fact that the teachers in their school are racist. They overtly um, kind of punish the black lads more than they do the white lads. They are critical of the way that they speak, which might just be a cultural kind of... Um, you know, slang, street style of speaking, uh, and therefore the, the way that they poorly interact with them and they, the way that they fail to motivate them effectively means that they dress in a particular way and they adopt a particular identity, which is a macho gangster style, meaning that they end up fighting back against the teachers underperforming in school and failing to take school seriously because, you know, they feel victimised, um, within that institution. Now, the final thing that I would like you to do is have a little bit of an assessment uh, of what we've learnt today, um, and you can break it down to some grime music, right? So this is kind of like a modern day, um, look at that, coming into the middle of a shot, it's ruined it now. This is a kind of modern day, um, you know, music style. I mean, we've got drill music as well, which, which might be just as useful to, um, to, to look at and, and to analyse. But try and analyse some grime music. What I would like you to do is, if you don't know, there's an example in the bottom right-hand corner from a fellow who's from Birmingham, um, from Smallheath. And um, what are the potential reasons that you could give for the emergence of grime music? What are the kind of lyrics, what they focus on, what kind of area does the music originate? Link it to the hardships that are faced. And can you link it to anything that we've looked at previously, maybe masculinity, maybe the resistance that we've looked at today, or anything else that we might have said um, in terms of um, any of the other theories. I, I will hand now and put online as well a couple of articles about grime for you to have a little look at. Um, it's just really for you to, to maybe focus and see how you can analyse more modern stuff from a sociological perspective. Because the purpose of this course isn't always just to sit there and be able to get 35 out of 35 or 15 out of 15. It's applying what you know and what you've learned to potentially this type of music. Um, so on the PowerPoint, there's also a few examples of some lyrics and stuff there that you could maybe analyze. Um, but um, once that is done, uh, you will see on page six, 
Uh, and on page seven, you've got the usual um, ending to your uh, uh, to your handouts, which are um, summaries of the key writers, and then um, quick check questions. Now on this one, there are no quick check questions written for you. So what I would like you to do is pause the video now and go through um, those quick check questions and summarize your key writers um, as well. Okay, as this was quite a quick topic, um, we are gonna look at a 15 mark question. Now we did one just last week and um, you're gonna be doing another. Now, obviously the purposes of these, not every question that you ever have to do will, you know, needs to be, you know, marked. Not everything you have to do needs to be specifically something that you're gonna get a grade back for in class. Um, but I'm gonna ask you to submit these just so I can skim over and have a look at them, all right? So the question that you are looking at is explain the relationship between ethnicity and membership of youth cultures. Those of you who've got hard copy will have one of these looking around. If not, I'll have added it before the lesson today. Um, obviously, it's another 15 marker, and yet again, um, it's AO1, it's AO2, you never have AO3 and a 15 marker, so there's no evaluation, only knowledge and your application of knowledge to the question. As always, it's gonna be one, two, three, and a minimum paragraphs of three, and then four if you absolutely need to. Now, I think you can easily break this down into three paragraphs, giving different explanations as to how ethnicity affects the membership of youth culture. Now, I would start with our first page looking at black subcultures, and in particular, I'll find a pen that works, um, in particular, looking at, not that one, Hebdige and Sivanadam, because they are gonna be given a different reason. Number two, I will be looking at Brasian. Okay, so using Johal for Brasian. And paragraph number three, I will leave that one up to you. You could do the media, and the impact on moral panics, or you can choose to do school. Um, so that is your choice. Now, paragraph number four, there's nothing in there about paragraph number four, because paragraph number four, we're gonna do a cheap paragraph on postmodernism. Last week when we looked at class and membership of youth culture, I said, End with point number four because what postmodernists are going to say um, is going to be the same thing that they'd say for class, for gender, and for ethnicity. So here you go again, and hopefully, if you did that on almost on a on a word document, you can almost use the previous weeks as a template. What are they going to say about ethnicity? And you can use some examples when we looked at maybe commercialization of black um, of black kind of style earlier on to support this idea um, that our postmodernists would be saying. So, again, it's a quick topic, it's straight to the point, and you're at home now with what I think is, a, is, is, is actually really beneficial, because this lesson, I probably I don't know how long I've been waiting on for, it might be half an hour or something like that. This lesson is, is quite quick, short, and a sharp topic. You've got, and you've done this stuff before, so you're familiar with that, you already know that, so it's basically looking at two additional sections for a 15 marker. And ethnicity has not come up yet. And it is, I think, a topic that when most people do youth culture, they'll just go, oh, well, I'll just, I'll know my four theories and then I'll hope that something will come up that I can answer a 15 marker using those. And obviously, one of them can be from that. But you actually really need to know this specifically, you need to know Brasian specifically, and unless, you know, maybe you would have been able to make that link to media and moral panics with, with, with Stuart Hall, but it, it's, a, it's a question like that, that if you don't know the content, you're really, really scuppered. So doing more questions now is, is you know, you're, social dis you're socially isolating, but whilst you're isolating, you may as well really make productive time here and just crank out as many essays as you can. 
Because the more you've got in the folder, I guarantee the better it is for next year. And remember, we don't know what's happening yet with, with, with second year. At the minute, if your exams are still at the same time next year as they were this year, so you get yours at the end of May, um, you've lost potentially six weeks of lesson time this year. So you've got to make good use of the lesson time now. You're stuck at home, you'll have, if you do this essay now, you will have done more essays than the current second years did during their time um, in the first year. Okay, so you will have already done more class essays because you've added this one on top of it. So the more you do, the easier it becomes. So crank out that 15 mark essay, and um, can you send it to me uh, at the end of today's lesson, please? If you've got any questions, I'll obviously be online um, now, so you can send them my way in chat, um, or you can ask everybody in the group if you want to, or if you've got any individual problems, then just send it to me privately, uh, and we can, we can sort them out. I'll see you back next week, um, and, um, and actually, um, if, if you want, I think what would be quite useful, I know I've already kind of said this, so you might have already done it, and you're like, oh, damn it, Dan. If you leave maybe the quick check questions until the start of next week's lesson, you can almost do those at the beginning to kind of remind yourself, like I would do, just a, a normal little recap of the previous week. So that might be worth doing as well. Okay, right, so I'll see you, uh, I'll see you next week. And, um, and yeah, get that work done. Send it in to me um, as soon as possible.